What's going on, everybody? As anticipated, I have Dorian Yates here with me, six-time Mr. Olympia, high-intensity training teacher, advocate, bodybuilder, instructor, all-around expert. Today, we're going to be talking high-intensity training. We're going to ask Dorian about his experience. Um, you know, maybe you could shoot a couple questions across if they're, you know, they fit the flow of the conversation. We'll ask him as well. Um, excellent. Nice to have you, Dorian. This is highly anticipated by myself and all of my audience, and they are going to have an absolute blast hearing your experience with high intensity training. Thanks for having me on. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> there are many aspects to, um, to being a, a bodybuilder, professional bodybuilder. Um, but I would say the training is probably, it's, it's where my heart lies, you know, it's, my, it's all important and it's all interesting and I've spent a lot of time studying everything. Um, but the training is what it comes down to, you know, the nitty gritty, uh, the, the, uh, the physical effort and the physical challenge, uh, in the gym was something that. I really enjoyed. I still do in in a different way. I've got different goals now, but uh, yeah, I love to talk about training and uh, what works the best and, and so on. Let me ask you this. How did you come across high intensity training? I know, you know, Arthur Jones, he kind of started to popularize it in the seventies. Now in your path, you probably began with the more traditional approaches to training. What, made you turn that corner into using actually, this approach. No. Actually, no, Jay. Really? Uh, no, not really, because I'll, I'll give you the whole rundown on my experience with weights. I was always uh, fascinated, you know, by physique and um, stuff like that. And the big fan of Bruce Lee, okay, he was not a bodybuilder, but, you know, he had that physique, he was shredded and could do all these amazing physical things, so... Uh, I was doing karate and I was doing push-ups and squats in my room and, and sit-ups and pull-ups and everything like that. And uh, <clears throat> once a week at the karate, we, we were doing some uh, freehand stuff like that. And then one day I got into the weight room. And I just, I don't know, I just it, it's hard to describe. I just fell in love with it and I thought this is for me. Um and I was introduced, I think it was Mike Mensa was probably the first introduction to high intensity training with what they called the heavy duty system at the time that was in the Weeder magazine. So I read that and um, <clears throat> that led me to Arthur Jones and the Nautilus books and Arthur's teachings and so on. Um, so I learned out about this when I was about 16 years old and it was fascinating. And then certain things happened to my in my life where I was not able to, you know, go to the gym. I didn't have that lifestyle. Uh, I got myself in, into trouble, went to youth jail, did weights in there. And, and again, I was like, come on, man, this is what I should be doing. Like, you know, not messing about. Uh, I got something here. I, I love this. I seem to be good at it. I'm stronger than everyone else. I got a better physique than everyone else in here. There's a couple hundred guys here. Um, so I was determined to do bodybuilding and make something positive out of it. Maybe, maybe I might be able to win some competitions or open my own gym or something like that. But I feel this is definitely the path for me. Um, so to answer your question, I was introduced to high intensity training philosophy quite early on. And there was something about it that <clears throat> seemed logical. And it gelled with the way I, I thought. And uh, also Mike Mensah's teachings were very kind of radical and challenging. And it seemed to make sense. But how did it work practically? So I was very analytical about it. From the day one, I knew that I was doing this thing as a career, not to look good on the beach or anything like that. I was doing it as a career. And I already had gathered a lot of information on training and nutrition, so I wasn't starting off with nothing. And uh, what I did is, I suppose it's a bit like a science experiment. I loved everything that I did. I, literally every workout from 1983 until 1997 is written down 
in, in log books, you know, we didn't have computers or nothing. So pen and paper, every workout's written down, every uh, weight, uh, every diet or change in diet, supplements, change in supplements, steroids, change in steroids, anything. All the data was written down and analyzed. And so I could see what was happening. If I increase the volume more, I go to the gym more days a week or less or whatever it was, uh, I could make an adjustment and then I could look at the data and basically get the feedback whether that's working or not working. So a couple of try times, you know, I had my faith in the high intensity training, but hey, you know, there are other people out there saying other things and they've had great results like Arnold and people like that, they're doing probably more volume and more frequency. And that's what everyone around seems to be doing and saying. So, you know, let's give it a go. Let's, let's, you know, I'm training three times a week. I'm getting stronger and bigger every workout. But, hey, maybe I can grow even faster if I train more, right? So I'll train five days a week. Hmm, guess what happens? A zero. Everything comes to a full stop. All right. Okay. Thank you for that information. Now what happens if I cut back again? Oh, I start growing again, again, bigger and stronger again. So... You know, I didn't need to learn that lesson that many times to know there's a formula here. Uh, first of all, you need to make some inroads, some stressful inroads into your body that it's not accustomed to. Okay, so more weight, more reps in this case, as we're trying to build muscle mass, uh, more overload that the body's not used to, so it adapts by getting bigger and stronger. So we know we need to send a stimulus. Okay. But then we also need to recover from this stimulus before any kind of overcompensation or growth can take place. So there needs to be sufficient stimulus, but then we need to recover from it before we come back and do, you know, try and do the whole thing over again, basically. Um, and the key to the stimulus is that stress, is that overload, that's intensity. And doesn't require that message to be repeated over and over again and uh, you know sure you, you know once you're going to failure you could do more sets and go do more sets to failure but i don't believe that you would be getting any benefit from it i believe you get a negative because now it's just just making it harder for your body to recover so it's the right amount you know it's like the right amount of medicine uh, and the right amount of recovery period uh, so that's the system. And of course, you know, people would say, yeah, but all the top bodybuilders don't do that. No, they don't do that. Uh, because they vastly overtrain, but they're able to recover from it because they're taking high levels of hormones. Okay. Yeah, you did that as well, Dorian. Yes, I did. I also took high levels of hormones, but why not have the most productive training as well as all those circumstances from my point of view and uh you know good luck to you if you're a natural bodybuilder and you want to go and try and emulate top pros or training five or six days a week uh you're not going to progress these guys are progressing one they're very genetically gifted and two of course they're enhancing their recoverability with large amounts of hormones so uh it won't work for you I mean, Jay, I get this all the time. Yeah, Dorian, but you was able to do this high-intensity training because you were taking steroids. No, quite the opposite. <laughs> you know, I was training optimally and using steroids on top of it. Instead of training suboptimally and kind of compensating it by taking steroids. So I believe I was getting better results than the other guys and quicker. And I took my genetics further. So, you know, yes, you can take long winding country roads to get to Rome. Or you could just take the highway to Rome. I mean, I'd rather just take the highway myself, but I'm not saying there's not other ways to get there. They're just not the most effective uh, from any point of view. Yeah, one of the main criticisms of HIT, well, first of all, is that only works when you're unnatural when you're not natural that's what they say hit only works for non-natural trainees so i put it together yeah, say that doesn't make 
Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. What the anabolics do is increase your rate of recovery. The anabolics is what allow you to do the high volume. And a lot of people ask, is high intensity training good for a natural trainee? I say it's the only training for a natural trainee. Yeah. If you want to see any progress at all, high intensity training is gonna is gonna be your best bet. Would you agree? Absolutely. That that was the point I was making. Uh, very gene genetically gifted guys are using sub optimal training. I'm not saying it's no good. I'm just saying it's not optimal. Not the most efficient way to do it. And unless you're uh, very gifted and or enhancing yourself uh, with anabolics, it's not going to work for you. So if you're currently training, whatever you're doing, let's say training four or five, six times a week, and you're currently doing that, and you have had no progress for the last two months, no measurable progress, no increase in muscle mass, no increase in your uh, strength, and let, let's, while we're on that subject, let's get this straight. I mean, it's not, um, it's not mysterious, this process. It's not, you know, people try to make it complex because they're trying to sell products. But it's not complex, yeah? You won't get bigger muscles unless you get stronger muscles. You know, vice versa. Like, you can get more power by a certain type of training without building the muscle mass. But in order to build muscle mass, you're going to get stronger. So... If you're curling 30 pound dumbbells now and you're curling 30 pound dumbbells next year, you'll be looking the same. Your bicep muscle mass will be the same. It's very simple. Let's make it, let's break it down uh, simply. You know, it, so if you haven't progressed in two months, you will not progress in the next two months because you're doing the same thing. You'll get the same uh, outlook. So that's the same outcome. So surely that's quite hard to, quite easy to understand. So if that's the case, what have you got to lose by cutting your volume down, right? Let's, let's try, try training two or three times a week, short workout. But when you go in there, you put absolutely everything into it. You concentrate, you focus, you push those last sets to failure. You control the negative. You do everything. You focus. Go in for maximum one hour, two or three times a week on the basic exercises, and you'll probably find you're going to start growing again and as i say i mean you didn't grow in the last two months so what you got to lose give it a go if you're still not growing well hey knock yourself out you know what do whatever but it's, it's worth a try and i think most people you know i had a gym as well so a lot of guys in there telling me that you know they're plateaued they can't they're not getting anywhere everything like that it's all right first thing you're going to do is you're going to take a full week off from training you're not going to do anything. And when you can come back, you're going to be on a more slightly abbreviated routine, a little bit less. Yeah. But it, it, it didn't even take them to start on the new routine. You know, the first couple of workouts, they're like, hey, man, I did what you said. I took a week off and I came back. And you know what? I can't believe it. I'm, I'm bigger and I'm stronger. I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, I can believe it <laughs> because you're simply overtrained. You had some rest. Your body was able to recover. And now, you know, as long as you go on a, a routine you can recover from, it should progress. Now, one of the questions I get all the time, if high intensity training works so well, why doesn't everybody do it? <laughs> so how do you personally, I have my particular answers for that, but um, I'm sure you've been asked that. What is your response to that? Um, first of all, You've got to understand it you got to grasp the principles because it flies in the face of you know more is always better like surely you know you're mr olympia you should be training six eight hours a day that's what i should hear when you talk and you're telling me you're doing 45 minutes four times a week doesn't make sense uh so there's that part of the human nature and the second thing it's fucking hard it's hard i mean you're really challenging yourself every time you go in there and this can be mentally uh, grinding actually very uh, recently I, I watched the video it was very, it was very interesting so it was uh, old school bodybuilders Boyako and uh, Danny Padilla and uh, they were talking about Arthur Jones you know when you had the Nautilus place out in Florida how all the top bodybuilders went out there to train with Arthur and learn how to train and it was like the hardest training ever and everyone went there Arnold went there Sergio 
Everybody went there. And, uh, you know, Mike Mensah as well. And Danny was saying he lived next door to Mike Mensah. And, you know, he, he acknowledged that Mike was a really smart guy. So, okay. So you're neighbors with Mike. I mean, so you guys must talk and uh, everything like that. So why is it that you guys are not following this training? And it was interesting what he said because he didn't say because it wasn't any good. He said because most guys just can't face that day in, day out. So they're just trying to find another way to, to get the same or similar kind of results uh, in a long term, maybe. You know, so, you know, they're trying to take a, a, an, an easier route, so to speak. But uh, I would rather... You know, maybe also it's got to do with the social aspect of going to the gym and feeling good by just being in the gym and being there. People like to, to go to the gym as well. This is a part of it. But I personally, I'd rather like say, well, look, I'm just going to go in two or three times a week. It's only going to take me an hour. And I'm just going to blast it and kill it and get out of there. And then I've got other things to do with my life. I've got time that I can spend with my family and my business and all, and all that stuff. And, you know, I had all day, man. I was a pro bodybuilder. Literally had all day. That's what I did, bodybuilding. Nothing else. Eat, sleep, train, recover, do it again. If it was necessary for me to be in the gym every day, like, I don't care what it, what it took. If it was necessary for me to be in there every day for eight hours a day, slaving or doing whatever, I would have done it. But that's not what was required in my opinion. And I believe I took my physique uh somewhere near its potential i don't know if anyone really reached potential but it's probably somewhere near it and of course other people have built great physiques taking other other routes um but in the end it boils down to this progressive resistance you know you're using more and more weights and however you get there some people get get there by what would be overtraining for most people yeah and the a huge problem that we have is you know, over here in the U.S., there's an obesity problem and a health problem, a cardiac problem. And people are under the impression you have to be in the gym for six, seven, eight hours a week. And I think the message is very important that you don't. You know, for the people who have the who like the social aspect, fine. But my I mean, my personal mission for this is to make the people aware that you can achieve damn near optimal results training just two times a week, maybe 30, 45 minutes. And if we introduce that, now we've got a great solution to a very big problem. And the, the, the largest problem is people don't have the time or they don't know what to do, they think, because trainers have complicated this so much. So I think there's a bigger message it's behind industry, this. Right? Yeah. It's become an industry, a huge industry, especially with the online business as well. So uh, everybody's, uh, you know, trying to make themselves stand out. And it's a competitive crowd. So you got to have something, some gimmick, some name, something special, the newest diet, the newest uh, whatever uh, to make yourself stand out. And I know because I've trained people and I've spoken to other trainers and they do stuff for their client, which they know is not the best thing to do for the clients, but they do it because they feel that the clients want that. You know, the, as I say, it's an industry. So the health problem uh, in the United States is, is spreading everywhere, obviously, because of the diet and uh, the lack of correct exercise, we should say. Um, the key is that you have to build muscle mass. Now, loss of muscle mass now, I've seen it like the latest kind of buzzwords that are coming out, scientific studies. Loss of muscle mass, sarcopenia, which is loss of muscle mass as you age, um, which happens every year after about 35, 40 years old, start to decline. If you can stop that and, and build your muscle mass back, it does amazing things for your health. It's not just about your appearance here. I mean, you know, that was a professional bodybuilding was my world. And uh, but I'm not that guy anymore. Now I'm 60 years old and I'm interested in, in training uh, and nutrition and so on, more for health and uh, quality of life. And I've trained a lot of people myself, like one-on-one. -on -one. And even, honestly, even myself, I've been really 
impressed with the results sometimes not like just wow this guy lost x amount of kilos or or whatever just with the health results blood sugar liver enzymes everything changing um uh with the loss of muscle mass you get a lot of diseases so if you can get your muscle mass back uh to healthy levels you're gonna have a healthier life as you age and less uh diseases and so on so that's what it's about and you can absolutely do that with a couple of short strength training um, workouts uh, that's what I did with uh, with my clients one-on-one -on -one and online and uh, now of course uh, I'm looking to do that on a bigger scale if you if people follow the correct diet and they put in just the correct amount of high intensity resistance training uh the health outcomes would be amazing it would be you know uh be a lot cheaper than the current method of uh dealing with health problems which is let them occur and then try to deal with them it's better to prevent them in the first place yeah and with longevity too i mean i notice um a lot of the times i like to compare you to ronnie coleman in terms of how your lifestyle is now you're doing yoga riding your bike doing all sorts of extremely active things, you know, with a torn biceps and triceps, which is no big deal. Ronnie Coleman's had 20 back surgeries and, and in a wheelchair. So your approach was obviously healthier in the long run and didn't destroy your future as it did with, you know, probably many other bodybuilders. Do you find other than Ronnie Coleman, uh, other bodybuilders um, are kind of banged up now? Not living the lifestyle you do? Well, bodybuild competitive bodybuilding is pretty tough, man. It's tough on the body. You're doing very extreme things. Not only are you trying to build extreme muscle mass, you're trying to get like, you know, extremely low levels of body fat as well. And usually you have to be a little dehydrated for the competitions. And you're pushing your body to the max under the circumstances. Uh, so there's always going to be some risk, which is not uh it's not relevant to the average person. We, you know, we're rather pushing it to the extremes here. Um, and I did have two injuries, a bicep tear and a tricep tendon tear. Um, but both of these occurred in the last six weeks before a competition because I was continuing with the super heavy high intensity training. But my body was not in, I mean, it's not really in a healthy state to, to have that level of body fat and everything. So I believe this, you know, affects your connective tissue and so on. So uh, I advise competitive bodybuilders now just to back off the intensity of the last two months before the contest, because at this point, you're not, you know, you're not attempting to build muscle mass because you're not having sufficient calorie intake. You're just really trying to maintain it. So it doesn't take that level of intensity to maintain. So it, you know, people point to my injuries as the fault in the high intensity system it wasn't the fault in the system. It was a fault in my application under the circumstances of getting ready for a competitive bodybuilding contest. And uh, probably also me not taking some downtime from heavy training and uh, some periods of lighter training and so on through all those years that I did. So I don't believe that that was a fault in the system. And uh, I'm in very good shape now. Uh, and I've evolved my training for what I need. I do a little bit of training, uh, light training, weight training, to maintain my muscle mass. Because I get, you know, I'm 230, I'm pretty lean. I've got good muscle mass for my health. So my job as far as muscle mass now is just to maintain it. And then I work a bit on my, uh, you know, functionality, flexibility and movement and I enjoy being outdoors and uh, enjoying having that fit, healthy body and, and able to enjoy other activities. So that's what I say to people that, oh, I like to go to the gym. Well, okay, great. Like, well, you can go twice for 30 minutes and do this hard training and build your muscle mass. And then you can do other things. You could play tennis. You could do yoga. You could ride your bike and you would just be more functional during those activities. So use those for your fun stuff if you like. Just get in and hit that and, and get the what you need for the muscle mass and of course uh the diet is also crucial for this which is something i believe because of arthur jones and arthur's uh uh attitude towards nutrition 
but this was 50 years ago and uh, nutrition is a whole lot more important than Arthur gave it credit for and uh, you know also now the food quality is not as good as it used to be even back in 1970s so that's something to take into account but if if you have this training and you have the correct diet it's it's a formula you're going to get results i don't believe it's a gray it's you know it's this mysterious gray area that uh, you know somebody's got to work out for you it's it's two and two and it equals four it's just uh, people haven't uh, realized it yet so my my dream is to get this to the to the mass so we can improve people's health mentally physically uh and that just has a huge out uh, effect on everything on it you know yeah i think a lot of people lives on people around them just on the knock-on effect of positivity that i've received from my clients like you know guys telling me hey my kids are treating me different my kids are treating me with more respect my, my <laughs> wife and, uh, and my co-workers and you know because they're just giving off a different vibe they're different frequency of feeling healthy and, and confident and it actually upsets me that people are not able to do that and i see people just wasting their time all the time like just you know jumping around in aerobics class you got all these ladies are still overweight uh they're still not healthy okay they're having fun great ladies but you need to build muscle mass that's the key to health as you age it's as simple as that and great if you've got good cardio and everything that's great but you're still losing muscle mass you know you're still gonna have negative health effects because you're losing muscle mass and you're losing bone density as you're getting older and the only way to stop that is resistance training now kind of looking back on your approach is there anything you do differently you said kind of reducing the intensity up to competition is there anything else that you would have done differently if you were to go back and do it like from a technical point training point of view um i would have see what i told myself is i would train like all out for about six to eight weeks because i learned through experience that's as bad as much as i could go or i would start to get symptoms of overtraining so then i would have to back off for a couple of weeks a little bit lighter and go again so i kind of built in this cycle but i don't believe that i really uh did the down cycle properly and gave my body enough rest that it you know it required over the years and uh most injuries are not um didn't occur in that moment they may occur in that moment but they're an accumulation of scar tissue and little things that are going on uh for a long time inflammation and so on that maybe was not addressed and was not given enough rest so i would have given myself a bit more rest and uh i tried to enjoy the the process a little bit more i was so tunnel visioned about what i was doing that uh yeah i could have had a little bit more fun along the way eased up a little bit but uh that that's what got me you know to be the best in the world so it's a bit hard to pick up on that yeah i mean that's kind of what got you to where you are now so i mean it was you yeah, were just kind of laser really, focused i don't i don't think uh, anyone achieves anything outstanding without making sacrifices and you know tunneling all their energy into that mm -hmm. uh, that's the way the universe works you know you only got so much energy and you tend to get a return on the energy that you focus the most so whatever it is that's what it's about mm -hmm. yeah um you've read body by science have you the the uh, I read body by science yes i can't remember the gentleman who wrote it but uh yeah, I mean, that's pretty much, uh, I'm on the same page with that as far as the training, which he was comparing longer training with the, the shorter workouts and the shorter workouts were getting better, if not equivalent results. So um, I don't, I'm not on the top of my head. I can't remember the numbers, you know, how many people are in the groups and so on. Um, but there seems to be more and more studies coming out uh pointing in this direction which you know which what basically arthur was saying 
50 years ago and uh, Mike Mensa was saying and I was saying and uh, I was a competitive bodybuilder that's what I did so if I was the best competitive bodybuilder in the world doing a total of four hours a week weight training why does anyone else think that they need to do more than that they're afraid you know it's it's like that that fear of what's referred to as leaving gains on the table but as early as the early 90s in most of the peer-reviewed journals high intensity training was supported by the literature it just yeah. wasn't popular so we've known since maybe the late 80s even that you need to train a muscle intensely in order to stimulate it to grow training to failure stimulates the most motor units and then you adjust your volume and frequency to accommodate so we've known this right. it's just we have not popularized it correctly um other than you and mike menser that's it <laughs> the, the well, you know, maybe it's not maybe it's not that sexy it's not no like it's fucking hard work it hurts um but there's a flip sign to, to that coin you know whenever you do something and you push yourself and it's uncomfortable and you get through it not only makes you physically stronger it makes you mentally stronger as well it's this is a lot of the reason that people go to the gym just you know to feel mentally good as well um so that's that's my goal yeah to get this information out to people and uh we're, we're going to start with some some studios and run people through it just to prove it we're going to collect the data on people and uh hopefully have some hit uh, studios around the world uh proving i mean when, once you prove the results i mean that's that surely should be it right once you everybody that comes through your doors get positive results nobody else is delivering that you know we're delivering lots of things there's even like nice machines and beautiful facilities and what have you but are they really delivering on what we all went there for in the first place uh after, most of the time not no and, and if they were nobody knows it because nobody's even tracking that track the numbers how many members have got how much income and all this stuff but uh people's results are not being monitored so uh my idea is to open these small studios with the monitoring on site as well so you do the body fat testing and strength testing the vo2 max everything blood testing uh, and then you know it's not mysterious anymore we'll see what results you get and if you trained a bit more often was it better or is it less or you know does yeah. this individual need more recovery or less recovery um, we're going to find out and we're going to find that yes there are di differences between individuals but they're not as vast as the very confusing fitness industry would have you know that's the stock answer right yeah yeah no no, no everybody's different though that's that means you don't know right that everybody's not that different yeah we all got the same muscles probably in this basically in the same place uh whether you're male or female it doesn't matter a lot uh we're, we're individuals in in the fact that we uh maybe take slightly longer or slightly less to recover from the exercise but there's not that many variables in there as as the industry would have you believe no there aren't um myself along with a lot of other of my colleagues i've i've probably instructed and recorded around twenty-five thousand sessions using high intensity training seems to be most people the vast majority of people get the best results from two workouts a week yeah. handful of exercises um and one set to failure you know i've i've experimented with three times a week i've experimented with multiple sets the results ended up being worse every time yeah so what um what approach are you going to uh, recommend in your studios how many exercises what exercises frequency volume what are you looking to do we're looking to do like a circuit of 10 to cover everything and you know we may be omit one of those or you know change it around but there's 10 there potentially we might do seven or eight or it depends on what the individual's requirement but there's 10 there um 
and we're using the air bike uh, as kind of a warm up and a, and a um, HIT sprint cardio. So a few minutes on the bike, uh, which is the main cardio I've been doing for the last few years is basically a one minute easy 20, 20 second all out sprints on that air bike and uh, three or four cycles of that a couple of times a week. That's all I've been doing apart from walking and riding my bike and my cardio results were were very good. So we're putting a couple of sprints in there for the cardio and then um, through the machines. And we're going to start with a whole body workout, covering a whole body twice a week, monitor the individuals. And uh, my feeling is as somebody gets bigger and stronger, they're potentially going to need more rest time. So it could be that, you know, and you know, what's a week anyway, is just a time period that some Gregorian monks made up somewhere, you know, like uh, maybe it's twice in every eight days, or maybe it's twice in nine days. We, we shall uh, experiment a little bit, but I, I think to get everyone going, it would be twice a week. And then we just see, or well, this guy's progress is slowing down a bit. How about if we just drop him back to like twice every eight days? Maybe it starts going again. So we'll play around a little bit. But uh, I would be in agreement with that for the average person. You could hit the whole body uh, twice a week as a, as a starter. I don't see the benefit, any benefit in it being more than that. So I don't see that anyone would need to come to the clinic more than 30 minutes twice a week that would be a maximum input as far as time and effort of course then there's the outside where, where there's the nutrition is very important the sleep everything like that so we'll be helping and monitoring with all that and we'll have experts on board in all these categories hormones sleep and uh, cardiovascular training, nutrition everything mm -hmm. now together, people would hear together right now you know people would hear two workouts, 30 minutes each. And that's what I did in my studios for years. Yeah. And they, they would think that's not possible. My response is, well, no, not the way you train. <laughs> it's not possible. No. But with high intensity training, certainly possible. So um, they're going to be training these individuals to failure, I assume. Yes. Um, Which is rather particular. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So to failure, proximity to failure. There's a huge range of what that what that means for people. In my studios, I get them as close to failure as humanly possible. Um, is there any kind of like rep cadence that you're going to focus on? You know, I'm sure you've heard of well, super slow. Uh, we, we're going to do uh, slow negatives. So basically two up, three or four down. And uh, we got some very exciting plans for the future to have the equipment computerized with the motor. And then we can program in, uh, you know, 20%, 25% extra on the negative. Uh, so, you know, you'd lift 100 pounds, it would immediately go to 120, 125 on the way down, which is something that I, you know, wanted to do for years. Well, the reason we tell people to slow the cadence down on the negative is because you're stronger in that phase. But if you had more resistance in that phase, you wouldn't need to slow it down. You'd keep this, you know, the same cadence. So that's something that we're uh, looking to do in the future with uh, Medex, by the way, is there's the, the company that I've just acquired with some partners now, and we're going to uh, convert the Medex company into this studios, high intensity studios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I had in my studios, all Medex. And if people aren't familiar with Medex equipment, they're pretty rare. You're not going to, you're not going to go into a gym um, and see them really. I mean, Medex was Arthur Jones's second company, and the biomechanics are amazing. They had some uh, very successful medical equipment as well for for backs and so on. Yeah. Um, but for many reasons, over the years, uh, the company wasn't really managed or utilized to the maximum. So, I think it's a great opportunity for for everybody to get this equipment. Uh, to the mass market equipment and now, philosophy. Now, what's your um, what's your opinion on equipment? What you know, what I tell people is free weights machines. They're going to result in the same results if intensity of effort is high. Um, machines may get you there a little more efficiently, a little more safely. 
So what's your opinion on that? A lot of people think there's this dichotomy between free weights and machines, but from what I can see, you use both, right? I use both, exactly that, because both, I see pros and cons in both. Um, machines are great um, because they're controlled. They have a controlled uh, pathway, which lends it to doing force reps and, and, and negatives more easily. And they can possibly isolate the muscle more than a free weight. Um, but a machine is a machine. It moves in a pathway in which the machine has been built. Uh, where a free weight moves in the way that my body's built, if that makes sense. So, you know, yeah. if you do a bench press on a bench press machine, I do one, or, you know, a guy who's six foot seven does one, it's the same machine, right? It's the same movement, but we're not the same build. We don't have the same uh, length of limbs. We don't have the same leverages, etc. So when you move a free weight, it moves more, uh, I don't know if this is the correct way to say it, but it more, moves a more natural pathway. If I'm doing a bench press, it might move slightly different with a free weight than if you're doing it. And it may move slightly different from day to day with myself, depending on you know what's tight and so on. And there's more skill involved in a free weight and there's more uh, stability. So they possibly could apply uh, better to explosive sports and stuff like that. But as far as building muscle, um, Really, the whole idea with the Nautilus machines is they were an improvement on free weights in that they distribute the load evenly throughout the movement. Um, for instance, let's take the Nautilus bicep curl machine as opposed to a barbell curl. A barbell curl at the bottom of the movement, there's virtually no resistance. And as you move through the movement, it increases till it hits the midpoint. That's the maximum point. And then from that point, it falls off again. So Arthur's idea was the shape of the cam would mean the resistance goes all the way through uh, the exercise. So in that regard, there were improvements. Sorry, my dog's trying to kill the car here. <laughs> One minute. No. If you guys have any other questions you want to ask, go ahead and uh, you can post them. I've got a couple more questions. <laughs> Put them in size, please. Ah, sorry. Can't so, um, <laughs> I know I put my dogs outside because they always bark when you're trying to do a podcast. No, it's like I they know. A cat and a dog, and you know, they do the cat dog thing. Sometimes yeah. they just sit next to each other, sometimes they want to kill each other. <laughs> it's only natural. So this is what everybody wants to know. Everybody would love to know. You spent some time with Mike Menser. Yeah. Um, what is the most valuable thing you've ever learned from Mike Menser? I learned some stuff from Mike Menser, but he, here's the one that were, you know, convinced me to actually cut back even more from uh -huh. what I was doing at that point when I first met him. When I first met him, I was basically... Um, you know, do a couple of sets to warm up, so one or two sets to warm up, whatever. Go go to failure, and then probably drop down about ten percent for a second set to failure. You know, one or two minutes afterwards or whatever. So basically, I you know I was hitting that nail in there and hitting it on the head just to make sure. Uh, and when I met Mike, it's like in his experience, he was still overtraining, even though he understood the philosophy is still like, oh, I should do a little bit more. Um, so he said, how about cut back to doing one set per exercise? So I trained, I did a couple of workouts with him and then implemented that when I got back. And uh, I do feel I got another little, you know, another little spurt of growth. Obviously I was still, I was already a very high level, um, I don't know if I'd won the Olympia or I got second. I think I got second in the Olympia by the time I met him. It's around about there, I think, 91, 92, when I first met Mike. And 
in between 92 and 93, I definitely cut the volume back a little bit more. I mean, it was already probably low compared to most people. Um, so yeah, that was the thing that I got with Mike and, um, he used mainly machines also. So I think machines that, you know, it's rare that you hear about somebody being injured on a machine, right? It's normally with the free weight. So mm -hmm. there's more risks with the free weights as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Mike Mentzer, he, you know, he had his consolidation routine. My opinion on the consolidation routine is yes, it will absolutely work if you first learn how to train hard. Um, but I think a lot of people are under the impression they're going to do three exercises every seven days and end up looking like you, but not unless they learn how to train intensely first. What do you think about like Mike's consolidation routine? I don't know really what that is. I know that towards the end of his coaching, he was recommending like longer times between the workouts, but there is also, there's going to be some point where you start to, lose size gains, I believe, if you're not giving any stimulation to the muscle. So once a week, once every eight days is as long as I would probably leave a muscle group. So I'm not familiar with Mike's consolidation routine, but I do know he had people training even less frequently. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, what was, what was your weight? In the Mr. Olympia, because you were huge at about, you know, what was it like three, four percent body fat? What was your body weight? Uh, was various between the years, in between 240 and 265, something like that. Yeah. Wow. And that's yeah. in ripped condition, right? Absolutely, man. Rip dry as a bone in the desert. <laughs> don't get much, you know, I don't think people, many people can emulate that kind of uh, conditioning. I was obsessed with having that crazy conditioning, even at the expense of muscle size mm -hmm. sometimes. You know, I wanted to come in like shredded, but also big. Well, I don't know, Doran, you came in bigger than everybody else. So I think you kind of, you know, they say you were responsible for the, the evolution of the mass monster. So you were focused on conditioning. Yeah, the original mass monster, whatever they want to call it. I mean, yeah. the bar got raised. And then, uh, you know, Ronnie Coleman raised it again in terms of size. And probably, yeah, there would be right to say oh it's spoiled bodybuilding because everybody started chasing that but not everybody can do that you know so they started i believe just using more and more chemicals because uh a guy has genetics like me and ronnie and uh people like that and also are willing to like just put the work in to a crazy degree there's uh not many around so was that so what's the difference between you know the mass monster and somebody who competes maybe at 220 is it is it a diet difference a, a drug difference i never really understood what the difference was what, well, it's know? a it would be a genetic difference a training difference to a degree and uh maybe a drug depends on the individual um but you have certain people that can carry more muscle mass than others. That's a genetic thing. So if you have a smaller frame, uh, lighter and so on, you might be feeling you could do better in the lighter classes or the classic or, or whatever it is. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the training is, is any different. Really, it, it doesn't need to be any different, whether they make it any different or not. I don't know. It's just gotta be hard. Um, a lot of people wonder about what your diet was like. I'm curious too. What was your diet like when you were prepping, trying to build yeah. muscle? Okay, well, it was a uh, high protein, one and a half grams of protein per pound, so up, you know, over 400 grams of protein a day. Um, fairly low fats, which is something I would change now with the knowledge I have, because we're not really realizing the value of fats then, and trying to eliminate them more. So I definitely have more fat in the diet. It's quite low, although I still have a few egg yellows, uh, you know, some chicken and beef and stuff like that. 
uh, and carbs. Maybe 400, 500 grams of carbs a day, even when I was dieting. I mean, I might go, certain periods go down to like 250, 300 grams a day, but uh, it was probably also with more muscle mass, you need more calories. So it was probably fairly high in carbs compared to most people. So you, you found that carbs, I mean, I personally found that carbohydrates help build muscle. Did you find that too? I think they help in the process, yeah. I mean, they're not directly in that, you know, is amino acids that build protein, but uh, for sure carbs are involved in the process, maybe with, uh, um, with the process of insulin. And uh, there's a lot of glycogen storage in the muscle as well. Muscle 70% right. water, right? Carbohydrates, each gram of carbohydrates is store nearly three grams of water in the muscle. So you got more carbs in the muscle, you're going to look rounder, fuller, probably going to feel a bit stronger and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't uh, train on low carbs. I mean, even if I was on 200 grams of carbs for me, I was, you know, I was having a hard time functioning. Mm-hmm. So do you think you think you would have so you're training four days a week, right? Some people there's a myth and I, I see this in the comments. There was a myth that you and they will say this about all high intensity training yeah. bodybuilders. There's a myth that you used volume to build your physique. Mm-hmm. Well, you use high intensity training to maintain it. That's what people believe because okay. they just can't wrap their head around that. You well, don't it was it was a, it was a marketing ploy, you see. I just pretended all these years to be <laughs> What I used to do actually is go down to Temple Gym and do this short high intensity training for about an hour, really, really fucking hard, right? Really hard, really heavy. But then I would come back at night when nobody's there and train for three hours because it was a marketing thing. So that's <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to say, man. Like uh, anybody that's ever trained with me would tell you how I trained. And, you know, there's only so many guys out there that, that trained with me and, uh, all been witness to the way I trained. So I never trained more than four days a week or four out of six. I might've done two days on one day off, two days, one, one day off. Uh, but never more than that. And yeah, I was doing a little bit more volume in the beginning, but <clears throat> it was still low volume. It was still like two sets to failure. Maybe that's, that's it instead of one. So I cut it back, but it was not, it would still have been a high intensity training, I guess in anyone's definition uh before as i would not be training for more than one hour and i wouldn't be training for more than four hours a week so uh how you want to define high intensity training but that's what it was Mm -hmm. and um that was to be a professional bodybuilder so there are some considerations that a professional bodybuilder has that doesn't apply to the average person like i gotta do some work for the side delts I got to do some work for the rear delts and so on. The average person doesn't need to do this specialized on these uh, small muscle groups and everything like that. They need to put, they need to put resistance through the main muscle groups with mainly compound exercises, uh, stimulate all the muscle groups in an efficient manner, and that's it. Get out of there. Yeah, there's a lot of people who will try to emulate bodybuilder routines because they have the good physique and they think that they need to work the short head of the triceps, long head, rear delts, all these things. Um, But even your workout was pretty basic. So from what I've seen from blood and guts, it was one to two exercises per muscle group, one to two sets to failure. So even when you were as a competitive bodybuilder, it was still far more basic training than what the rest of the people were doing, right? Uh, I don't know. I mean, for chest, I would do probably three exercises, like two pressings, one isolation. Back, I might do, well, it depends what you include in back, but I would do pullovers, pull downs, and a couple of rowing exercises, maybe four for back. Biceps and triceps, yeah, just two delts, two or three, and uh, one or two sets to warm up, and one to failure at the end, yeah. Legs was... uh, Leg extension, leg press, or squat on a Smith machine, mostly. Uh, hack squats, leg curls, deadlifts, and calf raises. So, no, you yeah, were, uh, the basic exercises, why? Yeah. They work. Everybody does the same exercises. You know, it's not a big 
mystery as far as the exercises that people use. And one big myth that pees me off now is this, you must change your routine or how often do I change my routine question? You don't, man. Yeah, you want legs, you do squats, you do leg presses, you want back, you do rows, you do pull downs. Uh, that's it. There is no, there is a point to cycle the intensity of your training, i.e. Uh, not training at 100% all the time. You probably need periods of two or three weeks of lighter training every now and then. Cycle the intensity a little bit, I would say that. But the exercises that work are the exercises that work. Why are you going to change them for something else? Because you saw somebody on Instagram doing a one-arm cable pull with a band or something. Yeah, it's just a waste of time. I know. Uh, but, you know, the gym has turned into a bit of a fashion uh, industry and uh, YouTube industry as well. So often it's about the look. Oh, how does this exercise look? And how does it make, how do I stand out and get views on my channel and all that uh, stuff? But I'm talking about training for results here. Yeah, I think people place way more focus on the exercise selection. This is kind of how you see the fitness industry going. Here's a great exercise for your inner chest, a great exercise for your rear delt. And people are under the impression that once they find this magic combination of the correct exercises, then they'll grow. Body but don't know which exercise the key you're component. doing. Your yeah. body does not know which exercise you're doing. It just knows if it's under stress that it needs to deal with or not. And there is no exercise for the inner chest and all this bullshit. Yeah? Uh, a muscle contracts or it doesn't contract. You can't just contract. Oh, I'll just contract down here and not over it. There's a lot of nonsense out there. Yeah? Uh, the muscle contracts, it contracts. You can put emphasis on different areas. But whatever exercise you are doing will not work unless you push it to the point where it's uncomfortable for your body and it has to adapt. And I suggest to choose the exercises which are tried and tested to work the best for those particular muscle groups and stop wasting your time on a magic exercise. The magic is the effort. The magic is the heart, the effort that you put in there into the exercise, not the exercise itself. Yeah, exactly. Not so much the exercise, but or the tool, but how you use the tool and how hard. Well, I mean, you know, you could, you could have a more efficient tool, but in the end, the tool ain't going to do it for you. The tool is a tool. You you got to use it, and you got to put the effort in there, and you got to train hard. But isn't it easier to say to yourself? Right, I'm going to get this exercise. I'm going to warm up one set. I'm going to warm up another set maybe if I need it. Okay. Now I'm going to get this one set. And I'm just going to like put everything I can into this one set. And when I'm finished, I'm going to put the bar down and I'm finished with this exercise. I'm done, man. Or you're like thinking, well, i got three sets to do. But I just hold back a little bit. The next set, I guess, even if it's not conscious, it's subconscious which directs a lot of our actions. So uh, even from a psychological point of view, isn't it easier to just think, well, I've just got this one set. I want to push the shit out of this and then move on. And I'll be out of here in half an hour. I'll be feeling good and I'll get on with my day. Yeah, I think maybe just people haven't tried it. So would that be, so if you had to give one piece of advice to people who are having a hard time gaining muscle, would that be it? Focus on that one set, push as hard as you can on that one set. Would that be your piece of advice? Absolutely. After warming up, Focus on that one set. Push as hard as you can. You know, try to select the correct resistance so you're going to fail somewhere between 8 and 12 reps. And write it down. What did you do today? Oh, I did uh, the bench press machine. I did 100 pounds. I did 10 reps. Okay, good. Right. So when you go in next time, in four days' time or whatever it is, when you're going to go do that exercise again, you know that you did 10 reps. Well, today, you must do 11 or 12. That's your goal, man. That's your goal for success, 11 or 12 reps. Just do more than you did last time. And you've got that goal in mind, and you go and you do it, and you achieve it, and you feel good, and you just build on that. Uh, that's, that's how you get the results, and that's why you went there in the first place. 
isn't it? I mean, I think so. He went there to look better, to feel better, uh, and, and to have a better health and a better quality of life. And that's all you need to put in is that time. Promise me. I promise you. If you try it, you're going to get the results. You just it's hard to get it across to people until they do it. You know, you yeah, get yeah. further like here's here's your body fat, here's your VO2 max, here's your strength. Do this twice a week. We'll help you. We'll show you. Let's check you after a couple of months. Look how much you've improved. Like, isn't that great? Isn't that worth like you know, following up and, and keeping up and, and trying to reach uh, somewhere? You know, at, at some point we should reach somewhere where we're happy, and then it's more or less a matter of just maintaining that physical condition of that, uh, and uh, and go and utilize the time and enjoy your life. Mm -hmm. And your studios are going to show people how to do this, right? So tell us a little bit more about you know when that's go when that is coming to fruition. Where people could get more information about um, your uh, Medex training. Yeah, Medex.com and Medexfitness.com, I think. Uh, Medex.com anyway. So there's info there. Uh, it's early days. We just purchased the, the company Medex. Um, so we're working on the machines, and uh, we're talking to some. Uh, potential owners now about uh, opening some facilities so we can test this. You know, we can run three people through this theory and and uh, demonstrate the results. And uh, eventually the plan is to roll it out into a franchise system, um, much like, you know, McDonald's, but for the good instead of the bad. <laughs> That's true. Uh, we work for the light instead of the dark, so we want to get a system that that works in getting improving people's health through building muscle mass uh, as a key to health and, and demonstrating that and getting a system because it is a system, it is a formula. If you put people through it, then the results may vary. Some people may uh, get a bit better results than other people, but the fact is, everyone will improve. They must improve. I mean, it's it's two plus two must equal four. If you do the right amount of exercise with the right diet, you're going to get these results. And there's nothing uh, mysterious about that. It's just about showing and teaching them, right? It's, it's about showing people the way. And, uh, you know, somebody gets the results, they tell their neighbor, they tell their friends, the people look yeah. at them, how, how are you looking so good? And they tell them, and that, that's the way we're going to have to do it because it's uh, a difficult concept for people to grasp. Even I had a friend of mine, I was telling him, he was like, no, surely not. I'm like, mate, listen, uh, <laughs> are, you, are you an investor? Yes, yes. I said, well, if I need financial advice, investment advice, I'll come to you. But yes, trust me, you can do this. Very short workout. Oh, you're sure? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm definitely sure. He messaged me the other week. He's like, damn, I've been wasting 20 years in the gym going six days a week, and I did what you told me, and I'm doing three days a week, and I'm in the best day, shape of my life. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I may know what I'm talking about here. Yeah, that's the experience I've had. Just, you know, I created a, a digital program showing people how to do high intensity training, and this is without instruction, and the results are insane. So yeah. it's just a matter of teaching people. And I'm glad that you came on today so you could te teach my audience. I've been doing content on this for like coming on two years now. It's starting to spread. And I think if uh, we continue to do this, I think a lot more people are going to see better results and then get to use the rest of their time to enjoy their life. Absolutely, man. It's my, uh, it's my passion now to get this out because I just want to affect as many people as I can in a positive way. Yeah. And this is how I can do it. And this is, you know, I, I have this knowledge. It's very frustrating seeing people in the gym. You know, they have good intentions. They're good for there for good reasons, but they're really wasting their time and wasting their effort. And, and it's a shame. And uh, hopefully, we can change that by getting getting some science out there. Yeah, like it, please. Not, not you know, real science. And the results in the end will speak for themselves. So we don't need uh, gimmicks. We just need to give results, which is why people are attending a gym or a fitness center in the first place. Yeah, we will, Doreen. We'll get it out there. I appreciate you coming on. We're coming up on an thanks, hour. I know you're short thanks, on time. Uh, thanks for the support. 
uh, My pleasure. Intensity uh, training and. Uh, yeah, if everyone can keep an eye out on my uh, social media, you can have a look on medex.com and uh, we'll be updating you with the progress. I'm excited and uh, I hope everyone else will be once they see what we're doing. Yeah, man. Anything I could do to help as well, you let me know. I'm here. Appreciate it, brother. Thanks a lot. All right, Dorian. Thanks for coming right. on. Thanks, have everybody. Have a good day, Neil. You too, Cheers. man. Take care. Bye -bye.